Hello, my friend, and welcome to TFU News and Views. I am your host, Anthony Brucali, owner, operator, madman behind TFU.info, the website, this podcast, Transformers University podcast, and oh, so much more. And I want to welcome you to a very special edition of TFU News and Views, as today we're going to talk a little bit about the forthcoming Netflix War for Cybertron trilogy, Siege, the first part of a three-season arc on Netflix for Transformers. Now, before I start and start talking about the show, I'm going to try to stay non-spoilery for as long as I can. And what I can spoil on the back end, I will... Uh, but I will give you a good, clear heads up when to punch out if you don't want to be spoiled about plot events in the show. That said, some things might get spoiled inadvertently because I am going to talk a bit about uh, how the show works, what it's like to watch it, and just the overall vibe of it. So just a heads up there. Uh, I will do my best to not spoil uh, plot points for sure. Um Hopefully won't spoil much by talking about particular characters that do appear within the show. But if you've seen the toy line, um, then you know what characters appear in the show. Because almost every toy is in the show. But before we get into everything about this program and my thoughts on it overall, I want to first thank Netflix for allowing me advanced access to the show. Uh, it was really cool of them to do that. Uh, they did provide us, however with uh, a list of things we couldn't talk about. And I I thought this was just interesting because I do want to read it to you. Um, So today that I'm recording this, July 27th, 2020, is the date that the embargo lifts on reviews for the show. However, there's a second set of rules to this. Um, It's not just a straight up embargo, don't talk about the show, but there are a number of things we still can't talk about until the show drops on Netflix on July 30th. So with that in mind, do please keep it here for July 30th when I will start to review this series episode by episode. Now first, let's just talk about the things I can't talk about. Uh, Because I find this funny because I got this email from Netflix about uh, the opportunity to see the show ahead of time and it it, right there in the middle of the email like before you can even really read the whole message is just the list of spoilers i can't talk about so i got spoiled on a lot of this before i even watched it um and don't worry i'm going to bleep this out because i would still like to be able to do this for earthrise and for kingdom when they do come so reviewers can talk about surrendering and ending up imprisoned and tortured but please do not reveal the AllSpark can be mentioned. However, reviews should not mention or a do not mention what happens to the AllSpark at the end of the season. The death of should not be mentioned. Do not mention the character and any details of episode 6 should not be revealed. This includes any cameos, i.e. Or the fates of any characters within this episode. Okay, so I can only review episodes 1 through 5, really, while we're talking about this. Um, But let's talk about the show overall. Uh, I've watched it twice through now. And I liked it. I I didn't like it at first. Uh, It it took me a little while to warm up on it. But episodes 5 and 6, the last two of this show are very good and by three and four you get a feel for the world and you get a feel for everyone uh there it is leaps and bounds better than the machinima series of the combiner wars trilogy from a few years back um that said it's not without its flaws uh but i want to stick to the positives here the writing is very good uh the characters develop We have more than just Optimus and Megatron and Bumblebee to contend with here. There are some unique takes on some very old characters that uh, are are certainly a different look. The voice acting, uh, for the most part, is pretty good. Uh, There's some nice references within the show to to bits of Transformers lore. Um, There are some nice parallels uh, on some of the things I can't talk about to previous incarnations of certain characters. 
And overall, I found it entertaining. If I was to sum it up, though, fairly quickly of what this series is like, it is Transformers as if done as a DC Universe movie. Insofar that it is dark, it is gritty, it is fairly humorless and joyless. And that's my big knock on this show. There, there is no fun to this show. It is about a war, and it is very much a realistic portrayal of a war. But in the fact that there is no fun, it's very hard to attach yourself to a lot of these characters. You see their development. You see them change over the course of six episodes. Um, you see what they're willing to do uh, for the things that they want. Like They're driven. It's a character-driven show. But by the end of episode six, do you care about a lot of them? Not really. Um, which means certain character deaths are hollow. Certain character appearances are flat. Um, it's a good springboard. But is it for me, the 41 going on 42-year-old Transformers fan? Probably not. It's rated TV-14. Um and I, I find it amusing that when the TV-14 pops up, the, the thing they point out as the reason why it's, uh, uh, you know, TV-14 is fear. Um, so the fear element is uh, kind of, and then the strobing effects, I think, are the two reasons why it is, is rated at, at this age group. But it's certainly not meant for younger kids, by far. Um, but uh, this has been done. You know, the story has been done. The gritty Transformers thing has been done. And this is done well. It's been done better. But this has been done very well. Uh, yeah, I just don't know who the audience is for this. Um, I know through my conversations with a few other podcasters, uh, and I think this is one sticking point I think we're all going to point out, is I don't like this version of Optimus Prime. Hasbro has lost the tone and the voice of Optimus Prime. And I don't mean Peter Cullen. I mean the way he is portrayed. I think most people's recollection of Optimus Prime is the 1986 movie, right? And probably the first two seasons of the cartoon uh, as a secondary port to that. Um, he is very much a father figure in that arc from the start of the series to the end of the movie. He is sometimes angry, sometimes goofy, but he's endearing, nonetheless. Prime, as he's been written here, as he's been written by John Barber for IDW, even as he's been written by Simon Furman to some extent, is a confused mess of a leader. And he seems to know what he wants in this series, but doesn't really explain why. And on top of that, there's a lack of empathy from this character. He just doesn't want to be Megatron in this series. And and this will lead me to some points about the acting, about the production of the show overall. Uh, and I know I'm kind of rambling all over the place, but I think this is, this is the best way to get my thoughts out on this. He is not the empathetic, caring Superman-style leader that you really want him to be. He is instead this confused guy who's been thrust into a leadership position and it's just not one i think you know the current times of the world have kind of maybe soured a few people on stories like this and and i think rightfully so i think a lot of us do want a kind of more hopeful happy story um or at least something to latch on to as we're in the middle of this action there's no fun there's no jokes there's no you know, attempts at comedy. The best line in here is that Bumblebee calls Wheeljack flashy face at one point, which um, I didn't even pick up the first time I watched it. But it leads me to my next point about the voice and the tone of this show and of Optimus Prime. Um, like I said, it's very well done. The animation's good. The voice acting is good. I'm not saying it's great. It's very middle of the road. Um... There are some performances that are better than others. Frank Todaro's Starscream is exceptional, as always. Uh, there's some you know, familiar voices, actually. Um, Sophia Isabella, who is Windblade on Transformers Cyberverse, shows up here as RC. 
And there's a lot of cast members, uh, a lot of people who show up. And they all get a bit of good bit of screen time and a good bit of development for, for such a large cast uh, in six episodes. And that is commendable on the writers and, and on F.J. DeSanto and his team. The thing that is problematic with this show from a production standpoint, and this is probably my realm of expertise that I might notice that you or at least be able to put together uh, more so than people just thinking it's bad writing or bad directing or bad producing is that and not everything gels together the way it should. So, for example, there are scenes where Optimus is mad or angry and the dialogue kind of comes out of nowhere. And I'm like, but you know what? On paper, that makes sense. Like the dialogue line to line would make sense. But the animation doesn't support the voice acting. So what happens is you have this angry outburst from Optimus at his troops to kind of declare that they are not the Decepticons, we don't do things that way kind of thing. But the visual doesn't sell that. There's no expression in Optimus' eyes. There's no expression on his face to do that. And that's where this fails. The other thing that I find that fails in this show is the music. The music doesn't drive me to be more interested in the show. It doesn't accentuate key moments in the show of, of character interaction, of loss, of betrayal. There, there's not a lot there with the musical cues that sell the rest of what's going on. There are subliminal things that make a show better. And it's one of those things I will you know, always point out when you don't notice it when it's good. When it's really good, you notice it. And when it's lacking, you notice it. But when it's good, you don't notice it at all. Um, you just go with it. And so that that is one section of this show that I kind of pegged out from the beginning first watch was the lack of music and the lack of musical cues to sell me on this. And go back to G1. Go back to Transformers Prime. Go back to Beast Wars. All of them had good music that were thematic to the show, that had repeating refrains and things you knew were the music for certain types of feelings and yeah a good show shouldn't tell you how to feel but it should make you feel what they want you to feel and i think that that's the other big downfall of this show now the individual characters they get some really good time on screen they get some really good development i think the big standouts here are jetfire and bumblebee uh having really good story arcs uh, Ratchet shows up, so if you collected toy exclusives, Ratchet is in the show and plays a big part, and uh, his story arc is very good. And one other that I don't know if he's been mentioned, but he's not on my list of people I can't talk about, and that is Sound Blaster, with Buzzsaw, nonetheless. Um, Sound Blaster is a really cool addition to this series. He is a mercenary. He is a clone of Soundwave and a failed experiment at that of Shockwave. Uh, and it is all really good. And oh, going back to the voice acting, some of these voices are really good. Sound Blaster has a really good voice. Um, Bumblebee, you know, his look, I keep mentioning, I mean, mention this, but he's got Guy Liner on. Um, he's like emo Bumblebee, <laughs> which to me is very, very funny. Um, he doesn't have an Autobot sigil this whole series. If you've seen the art, there's a reason for that. Uh, I won't give that away just yet, but Jetfire has a good arc. And the one thing that really bugs me about the voice acting here, and this is just popping back into my head, some of it is really good, but a lot of the Decepticons as they show up, big ones and you know ones with lesser roles. So Jetfire and Spinister and Barricade and Skytread, they all seem to just talk down here. They're just really low and gravelly and really indistinguishable from one another. And it's it's just, it's kind of frustrating because you can use uh, the voice to be a character uh, without having many lines. Uh, as Rob Paulson, a famous voice actor from Pinky and the Brain and, and the original Transformers series and God, just about everything, right? Ninja Turtles, uh, I think is always this big one, right? He usually refers to voice actors as little v, big A, meaning the voice is only part of it. It's the acting that really sells it and I, that's the thing i think the choices in the acting here and the other thing i've noticed with the voice acting of, of something that seems to take away from it is that 
this is done how a lot of animation is done these days where voice actors are not together they're in separate rooms and i guess now in post covid 19 world that's going to happen more but you don't hear who you're acting with you don't get to play off of the other person's line the other person's choices i would think that for a future version of this show uh for earthrise for kingdom is to put these actors on a zoom call together and record them together um because even in hearing some of these edits there are some especially in episodes one and two some weirdly chosen delays between reactions just little things that could really sell this show so much better and i think the actors are good enough that they would play off of each other uh but in a void where they're told to read a line and read it a couple of different ways and then they you know an editor and a producer somewhere kind of pick what goes together best sometimes you don't always have the thing that goes together best so you just pick the best two that work together and that's one thing i would like to see for this show going forward um because the actors are good but they're not good enough to pull it off without anyone around now i think i'm going to get a little bit into some minor spoiler territory now i'm not going to get into uh big plot elements a lot of the big plot elements i already told you i can't talk about but we're going to get into some minor spoilers going ahead and so i'm going to give you a minute to punch out so i'm going to play a promo and then we've got about five seconds after the promo before you punch out so if you're going to punch out here thanks for listening uh please subscribe to the show wherever you listen to your podcast and uh, stay tuned for the individual episodes july 30th on netflix worldwide and after you watch them come back here for individual episode reviews plus all of our Transformers news and coverage. It is a world transform where things are not what they seem. Transformers. Want to learn a bit about the Transformers? Think you know everything about Cybertron, but are looking to learn a little bit more. Enroll today at Transformers University Podcast. Each episode will tackle a piece of Transformers history starting in 1984 and marching our way up to today. Hosted by me, Anthony Brucalli, three-time Emmy Award winner and consulting producer on Netflix's The Toys That Made Us, and lifelong Transformers fan, we'll go on a journey through cartoons and comics, toys and movies, and all the weird esoterica from around the world, chronicling the adventures of everyone's favorite robots in disguise. Listen to Transformers University on iTunes, Google, Spotify, YouTube, and wherever you get your favorite podcasts. Transform and roll out! Okay, a couple of final things. Spoilery stuff coming down. So if you hadn't punched out yet, it's your last chance in 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Here are some spoilery things I want to talk about. And like I said, minor, minor spoilers. But uh, certain characters that show up, certain characters that have arcs. Um... We're talking about Jetfire and Bumblebee having really good standout arcs. Megatron, it took two watches for me to really get his arc, and uh, it was pretty good. Um, But again, he is not sold by his music cues. And I think that's my first problem with this show. Um, There are themes here. There are really good, well-written themes here. There's a theme of hope. There's a theme of peace. And there's a theme of choice. Um, There's a scene at one point where Ultra Magnus has a chance to kill Megatron by shooting him in the back, and he doesn't take the shot, and Megatron makes him pay for it, and he teaches that as a lesson, uh, always take the shot, and there that little bit of choice kind of echoes out from that point on. Uh, there's a theme of hope here, and I think this is the one that really gets me. Um, there is a relationship somehow between Elita One and Optimus Prime. Uh, there, it, it's hinted at being romantic in some way. There is a world they are fighting for. There is a future they are fighting for. To have together in some way. And this is, this is hinted out at least three times in this series. The music cues don't sell it. And moreover, the writing doesn't sell it. In that they never showed us what that world was or could be there is there there's talk of it but there's no explanation 
there's no visual. This is the TV 101, show, don't tell. They never show us what they're fighting for because ultimately what they're fighting for is to just not fight anymore. And that leads us to the third theme, which is actually done fairly well, and that is the theme of peace in that everyone's choices in this series are here so that they can achieve peace. Um, Bumblebee makes choices and even says for peace uh, when he makes his big choice in this series. Megatron makes his choices to rule because he feels he will end the war. Um, but he becomes a bit of a megalomaniac along the way. Optimus makes his choices to save his people and Cybertron and pursue his end of the war for peace later on. So that theme is actually done really well. Uh, but the other two themes are fairly empty and, and it's kind of disappointing. And finally, there's a couple of, I don't know, missed opportunities or different changes. Some are good, some are bad. Red Alert is a doctor in this series. That really should have been first aid. Um, Red Alert's never been a doctor. He's not even an ambulance. He's a fire chief's car. Uh, so that, that was a weird, weird choice. Um, we can going to ask me, well, why isn't it Ratchet? Ratchet has a bigger role to play elsewhere. Um, there are no new characters in this series. As uh, someone had asked me on Twitter uh, just a little while ago. And so I think that was Zach. Uh, so Zach, there are no new characters in this series. Uh, there is a lot of body horror in this show. Uh, so much so that it, it's kind of off-putting. Uh, the dialogue is not slavish. Uh, shout out to Mike Seibert for asking me that. It's not slavish to G1 in a lot of ways. There is are a few till all are ones. There is a freedom is the right of all sentient beings, but it's not said by Optimus Prime, though it is attributed to Optimus Prime. But you'll get that one out of the way early, I promise. I do like that Wheeljack and Bumblebee are the first two characters you see in the show, just like in the original series. And Wheeljack does have the first line again, just like in the original series. There are some references to uh, other Transformers lore. Um, Velocitron gets mentioned at one point. Dreadwind or Dreadwing, I forget which one, gets, gets mentioned. Does not show up. There is at least one really weird character cameo in the last episode that doesn't really do anything and doesn't really show anything, but he's there. But finally, I don't want to wrap up on, on a negative note. I know I'm nitpicking here a lot of things. Um, and it sounds maybe that I didn't like the show. I did enjoy the show. Like I said, it is entertaining. Um, it's just not necessarily what I want from a show. It's not necessarily what I would tell people to watch. Uh, as a series, it's it's certainly there if you want something to watch. Um, if you want something that's entertaining and fun, I would tell you to watch Transformers Cyberverse in a heartbeat over this. And, and that is despite the fact that I despise the first half of the first season. But all in all, I don't feel like you would be wasting your time watching this series. It's two hours and change once you get down to how long this show is. It has some good elements. It has some interesting takes on a story that I really feel didn't need to be told. So I guess that's good. Um, and it has some old friends of ours uh, in a new light, uh, which take that as good or bad, depending on how closely you hold those old representations of those characters to your heart. That said, July 30th is when this show drops. Uh, do check it out on Netflix. Uh, do watch it, do support it. Tell the folks that have written and, and, and worked on the show, FJ DeSanto, uh, Gavin Hignight, who was on a writer on Cyberverse, Brandon Easton, who was a writer on Mask for IDW. Um, give these guys a shout out and let them know what you think of the show because I think uh, they did some good work here and um, I think it's going to improve. Um, one last thing that's in my head is the budget side of this show. There's not a lot of transforming, <laughs> which I thought was weird. Um, in, in that there are robots and there are vehicles and there are generics. If you love it, like generics, you're going to love this show. 
but the animation of going from one mode to the other is missing uh, for a lot of characters. Uh, there's a lot of smoke and mirrors, uh, so to speak, and how they do that, and um, it, it's kind of it's kind of frustrating. That's part of the magic of watching Transformers uh, is seeing how they shift <laughs> from one shape to the other. But do watch this show on Netflix, July 30th, 2020 is when it drops. And be sure to come back here to TFU News and Views and to Transformers University for all the latest on this series and our look at Transformers history. Once again, I am your host, Anthony Bricali, owner, operator, madman behind TFU.info. Until next time, see ya. Hey, want to help out this podcast or the website tfu.info? There's a number of ways you can do it. Let me tell you how. You can help us directly by joining our Patreon and enrolling as a student at Transformers University. There, you'll get early access to the podcast as well as exclusive behind-the-scenes peaks and perks for as little as $1 a month. Sign up is quick and easy. Just swing on by to www.patreon.com slash tfuinfo. Another way you can help us is by using our Amazon link, www.tfu.info slash Amazon. Type that into your browser whenever you want to shop at Amazon and a portion of what you spend will be contributed back to us. It's that easy. Finally, you don't become the world's longest running transforming toy archive without some help from other fans. We're always on the hunt for photos of figures and accessories we're missing from our pages. If you'd like to contribute, go to tfu.info slash help for a list of what we need or send an email to info at tfu.info. tfu.info, the Alpha Trion and Omega Prime of Transforming Toys. Now, back to the show.